So, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome at this webinar, How to Make a Poster. Dr. Roger Sturmey, Basic Science Officer of the Azure Special Interest Group Embryology, uh, will be our speaker today. He will talk about the basics of what a poster is, what the purpose is of a poster, and will end with some top, top tips. After the webinar, we will have some time for questions. You can enter your questions in the chat box, and we will go through them at the end of the webinar. So, Dr. Sturmey, I give the floor to you. Thank you very much for that introduction, and thank you all for giving your time to come and hear me talk about some views and opinions that I have about what make an effective poster. Um, as Titsia has said, I'm a basic science officer for the SIG Embryology at, at Eshray, but I'm also a senior lecturer at the Holyoke Medical School, where I teach medical students, PhD students and master's students a range of skills and techniques, including reproductive biology, but also more general techniques such as presenting posters. So I'm hopefully going to talk to you for the next 25 to 30 minutes, not too long, hopefully, just giving you an idea, some ideas and concepts to think about as you start making your poster. And before I even do that, I would like to say congratulations. If you're at this webinar, that means you're here to learn how to make a poster. And I conclude from that that you have been fortunate enough to have your abstract accepted for presentation at the upcoming X-ray conference. You should be very proud of yourselves for that. Not every abstract is accepted, so well done. So over the next 25 minutes or so, I'm gonna ask or answer, try and answer some key questions. Firstly, what a poster is, and then consider what the purpose of the poster is. And then we'll look at the anatomy of the poster and how that is designed to get your message across. Throughout the presentation, I'll be asking you to think of the question, who is your poster for? Is it for the reader? Is it for Eshray? Or is it for you? Also throughout the presentation, I'll cover some suggestions of how you physically go about making your poster. They are suggestions, they're not absolutes. You may have different ways and methods of doing so. I've got 10 top tips at the end for what I think makes a good, or more importantly, a bad poster. And I've got some examples of what I think are posters that could be improved. And there are things for you to think about, and we'll close up with a summary. So the first question, what is a poster? Well, posters are images. They're pictures, they're advertisements, they're ways to get people interested in the content that they are presenting. So these are a selection of movie posters that you can see on your screen. They're visually attractive, they're appealing, they contain key information. They tell you the name of the movie, the one in the middle, Goldfinger, a classic James Bond movie. They also have other key information on who is playing Bond, who is doing the work, who has made the movie. Albert Broccoli and Harry Saltzman. These are key features of a good poster. You may not think of it, but your scientific poster must have these key features on. I would suggest not putting an image of Sean Connery on, however. So in terms of a, a, a scientific poster, it's a visual presentation, just like those posters that we've just looked at, of novel research or findings that you're gonna present in a standardized and systematic manner. What that means is they contain, they must contain key relevant information. And really highly important, possibly the most important thing to put on your poster, and you'll be surprised how many times I've seen this missed, is your names, the names of the people that have done the work. You then have on a poster some contextual text, some background, what does the post presenting, what is the, the study designed to do, and then, you'll have your data, your findings presented as figures or tables. And finally, you'll finish off with a summary and a good poster always has a message. What is the point of the poster? What, has the, what are the results and key findings that are coming out from your piece of work? And your poster is your visual presentation of the work that you have described in your abstract. So you already have your findings, you already have your message. It's, you've presented it in a way that has been effective enough to be accepted as an abstract. But a poster is different because it's designed to be read and assimilated very quickly, but also contain the key figures supporting your conclusions. 
So the main conference isn't too far away. It may feel like it's a little way away um, in Vienna, but it's actually coming quickly. So now is the time to get planning for your postdoc. And the planning takes for me two key phases. The first phase are the details of the poster, the dimensions and the format of the poster. How big does it need to be? How does it need to be made? You also need to get fixed in your diary right now if it's being presented when that is, but more importantly, when your poster has to be submitted. So that's the, the logistics of the poster. More importantly is the content and structure of the poster. And I'd ask you to hold three questions in your mind whilst you are preparing your content and structure. Is that content needed? Is it clear? And does it confuse? A poster is different to an abstract. It doesn't need all of the words that were in your abstract. It certainly shouldn't contain them all. It should be very quick and easy to read. So let's consider the details of the poster. Well, for an SRA presentation, you will shortly be receiving details from a company called Estensis, who manage our poster submissions and the presentations. At the SRA Main Congress, all of the posters are presented in electronic format. If you imagine having a room full of 1800 paper posters, well, I'm not sure there's a room big enough in Vienna, in the whole of Vienna to manage such a thing. What I would say, though, and I'll come back to this a number of times, is follow the rules in detail from the organisers, in this case, Estensis, particularly the dimensions. You'll be given clear instructions on how big your poster needs to be, the size, the uh, format and the resolution. Please make sure you follow those rules to make your poster visually accessible when you come to present it. So what program are you going to use to make your poster on? I remember the first poster I made as an undergraduate student, which was back in the last century. We actually used A4 pieces of paper and stuck them to a large piece of sugar paper. It looked pretty um, low rent, but it did the, um, the job. But we've moved beyond that now. We, we no longer present scientific posters like that. We use computer programs, of course. There's a whole host of programs that you can use to make a poster, and I've listed a few here, ones that I've used in the past, Corel Drawer if you have access to it, Microsoft Publisher, Illustrator, Keynote if you're a Mac user. But actually these days, Microsoft PowerPoint is as good as anything to make a poster on. It's simple, it's accessible, and most people have some experience of using PowerPoint these days. I'm not going to tell you to use PowerPoint over Publisher or Illustrator over Keynote. That's a choice for you to make along with your co-authors. But whatever form program you do use, thinking back to what I said about the instructions from your organisers, make sure you submit your file in the requested format. If you are asked for a PDF, send a PDF. If you're asked for a PowerPoint presentation, send a PowerPoint presentation. Because it needs to be accessible and it needs to... to Organisers need to be able to open your file and present it. I'm going to focus on PowerPoint because I, anecdotally, this is the, pro, the programme that most people tend to use to make posters. PowerPoint does have its limits. And what I would say with PowerPoint, and I would say this, I would give this advice with any Microsoft programme, is try and keep your file sizes proportionate. Don't make mega file sizes because PowerPoint Microsoft programs in general struggle with huge file sizes. Ways that you can restrict, reduce your file sizes is to make sure that if you're putting images in, you don't have lots of background white um, content for the images. Try and reduce where possible the resolution, making sure that you maintain a sufficiently high resolution for presentation. This kind of information will probably be pre provided to you from a stencil. You are going to have to change the dimensions of your PowerPoint presentation because, as, as many of you will know, if you open PowerPoint, it assumes you're giving a presentation like the one you're looking at at the screen, designed for a computer screen. This is the kind of thing that can cause a little bit of frustration at the start, so I'll be very clear and try and explain how to change the size of your and shape of your slides. It's quite simple. Head to the File menu and then drop down to the Page Setup. And in page setup settings of PowerPoint, you will find the 
icons to change the dimensions and enter the numbers, the values that will be provided to you from a census. When it comes to putting your figures, your data, your images in, wherever possible with PowerPoint, use the insert function rather than copy and paste, because this does maintain resolution of your files and make sure that they appear clear when blown up on the big screen. A general tip for PowerPoint. PowerPoint on Mac, if you're a Mac user, is not exactly the same as PowerPoint on a Windows machine. So even if you're asked to submit a PowerPoint presentation, this is the one caveat I would say to making sure you submit your presentation in the requested format. Submit in the requested format, but also always prepare a PDF version as well as an insurance, just in case. This is not a lesson in how to use PowerPoint. I could do an hour presentation on that, although I, I'm far from an expert myself. However, there are a number of really excellent YouTube videos on how to use PowerPoint functionally to make a poster. What I want to focus on is how to make an effective poster in terms of what the content should be. So let's move on to the content. You need to have the title of your poster on there, and that's already written because that was your abstract title. And you need your name and the names of your co-authors and your affiliations. That needs to be big enough to be read from a distance of around about two meters. So think about the font size that you're going to use. And to give you an illustration, I would recommend using a font size of at least 60. This is the font size that the number 60 is in for your title at a minimum. Although your names can be smaller. And again, to give you an illustration of the size of the font on this screen, the text on this, these slides is written in font size 28. So a good, clear, big font for your title so that people can see it. Because on the um, electronic po um, poster presentations, people will be scrolling through an iPad, looking for the poster that they want to see, that they've identified, that they want to read from the abstract book. Make it really easy for them to find that poster by having the title clear and bold. So you've got your title, that's already written. You then need to have that contextual text, some background, an introduction. The difference between a good poster and a great poster, in my view, is the amount of text. A good poster has the text on there that's necessary to understand the poster. A great poster has just enough text on there without having too much. So with regards to your introduction, try and keep it brief, try and keep it short. Little is better. Thinking about writing a whole essay on a page of a poster is not a good idea. Most people will try and read the poster in one to two minutes. That's really not very long. They're looking to make to be led through the poster to be able to pick up the key points and get to the data, to get to the findings, to see what you have discovered. So with regard to your introduction, keep it brief. Little is good just enough to explain why you have done the poster. This is not a literature review. This is not an opportunity for you to, to explain how many hundreds of papers you've read. There are different opportunities to do that. With your introduction, keep it clear, keep it simple, and keep it really easy to read. In a couple of slides, I'll give you an example of how the text on a page can make things difficult or easy to read. Effective use on space, on, of of space on posters is really important. Having no space, no free space on a poster leads to a poster looking cluttered and means that it can be very difficult for the reader to access the key information. And this is key. I asked you to think about who your poster is for. Well, partly it's for the reader. It's for the person who has read your abstract and is really fascinated by your research and wants to come and learn more. So they need to be able to read the, that poster and get information from it quickly and easily. They need to be able to see your results quickly and easily. So you need to help the reader and lead them through it. And this is where the design of the poster comes becomes key. So let's consider the anatomy of a poster. Here I've made a blank poster. I've got a nice pale background. The printer, if, if I was printing this poster out, having a hard copy, the printers would be happy because there's no big dark colours. And I've got the space at the top for the title of my names. 
However, I'm sure you'll agree that that is a little bit lost. The white background and the pale, the, sorry, the white text and the pale background doesn't really stand out. Boxes really help. They provide structure. They provide a boundary for the names and the titles. And I know that in this box is the name and the title. I'm gonna make that title dark text because that makes it stand out even more. Dark text on a pale background is always easier to read than pale text on a dark background. So now my viewers can see the title of the poster, they'll know who's done it. We'll have an introduction, a brief introduction outlining what I've done, what the background is leading up to the work and what the key research question was. A section on methods, how have I conducted my study? What, what was the experiments that I did? What were the observations that I made? Then for me, the killer information, the results. This is what people want to see. What have you discovered? The chances are, if somebody has identified your abstract to read, they're already interested in your topic of research. So they don't need lots of background. They probably are very familiar with it, but they want to see what you are adding, what your new novel research is. And then a conclusion. From the basis, on the basis of your results, what do you conclude? Why is this work important? What is the key message? And at the bottom, as a footnote, you may have some acknowledgements and some references because you may be citing and referring to other people's work. So that can go at the bottom and that can be quite small. Well, is that the best layout for a poster? It's a traditional layout and it's an effective layout. But look at the size of these boxes. I mentioned to you earlier about making your text easy to read. Here I've written a block of text in a long text box. And as you can probably see, long boxes that will likely be full of text that you have to read across the page and your head will be going like a typewriter, ping, to read all the way to the text at the end of the page and you might lose your place. Oh goodness, where am I? Back to the start, long boxes that will likely be full of text that you have to read. It becomes very difficult to read long lines of text across the length of a poster. What happens is that the reader finds it too difficult and they think to themselves, I'm going to go and see who's got the best coffee. And you've lost your opportunity to engage the reader into your poster. So how can you counteract that? Well, think about other examples where large pieces of paper are used to present text. Newspapers. Newspapers are really broad pages, but they always write their articles in columns. And you know, if you read a newspaper, that you start from the left and you read across and you get to the bottom of the column and then you move to the next column. And you rarely lose your place in reading a newspaper article because they have these short lines that you can stay focused and concentrate on. So I would recommend using shorter columns. So here we've now got the introduction as a column, compressed not across the length of the text of the poster. Similarly with the methods, these are likely to be your most text dense, wordy section. That gives you a big space in the middle of the poster for your results, the killer information, the information that you should want your readers to see. And the space at the bottom for your big bold conclusion. I have been able to show X because of Y and this is important because of Z. Really bold, clear conclusion. And the acknowledgements and the references. Small, regular boxes for the text dense parts. Bigger space for you to put your figures into. And I would always recommend numbering your sections to help orientate the reader. Having a number for one, box one, this is the first box that your reader should read, the introduction. Skipping over to the methods before moving to results and conclusion. You're leading your reader through the map of your work by using numbers and boxes to keep the reader focused. If the reader reads the introduction, but doesn't feel they need to read the methods, they can skip that and move directly to the results. But at least the order is clear. Well, is that the best way to present a poster? <clears throat> I've seen this done recently, which is actually quite a nice opportunity, quite a nice um, example. 
Title and names, introduction, methods, results, conclusions. But again, just like a newspaper, immediately after the title, having a headline finding. Clear, crisp, single sentence to say what the outcome of your poster was. This poster presents the results to show X. The reader will immediately be interested in your work and want to move to the introduction, the methods, see how your data supports your headline finding, and then you can refer back to your conclusion. Poster layout is personal preference. So I've given you three examples of poster layouts there, and you can be a little bit creative. You can move things around so they fit the text and fit the figures that you need to get on your poster. But do think of the reader. Numbered sections will often help you to get through, to help your reader to get through your presentation, get through your poster. Things that will make it difficult for your reader are overcrowding, too much on your poster. Using a small font to try and get lots of text because you've got a lot to say, this will always make it difficult for the reader to follow the poster. And too much clutter. Things that don't need to be on your poster. Everything that is on your poster should be there for a purpose. The introduction should be there to introduce what you have done. The methods should be just enough to explain how you have done it. The results should be there to support your conclusion. Think about having a constant flow through the story that your poster is presenting. More practical tips, fonts. <clears throat> Wherever possible, and it's always possible, I really recommend using a plain font. Examples include Arial, Helvetica, Calibri, or Atapush, Times New Roman. Always avoid going wacky with some of the fonts. PowerPoint, Keynote, Word has a range of fonts that you can use that look interesting, wacky, creative, but they become difficult to read. They can be exceptionally difficult for some people to read. Simple, clean, clear fonts will always make your poster easier for the reader to access. A word about the figures, the data that you're going to present. <clears throat> keep them clear, keep them clean, keep them simple. I've already mentioned the word clutter, extra stuff that doesn't need to be there. This is a, a made up set of data, <clears throat> a figure that shows the difference compared to a control in response to three drugs, drug A, drug B, drug C. For me, this is a terrible figure. Using three dimensional boxes mean, it makes, means I'm not clear what this number is. Is it 80? Is it 60? Is it 50? This one becomes even more difficult because it's further away from the axis. The shadows are just distracting. And then we have these grid lines, which are there to help me try and identify what the numbers are. But again, really add very little information compared to the same data presented on a plain, simple graph. The, legit, the axis is labeled. No need for 3D bars because I can now clearly see that the value for control was around about 70. Drug A was around about 40. Drug B, 110, and drug C, 90. Much easier to quickly see the differences between those treatments and what those values are. No need for additional grid lines to distract me. Much clearer, much simpler. In simple terms, this I would call a figure of data. The top one I would call a graphic might look appealing, but very difficult to access. The really important information that here, drug B is better than the control. So you've made your figures, hopefully you've kept them really simple, really clear, really crisp, without any additional information, without additional clutter. You then need to put them onto your figure, onto your poster. PowerPoint has a really useful tool called Align. 
If you go to the format menu, you can select the align tool and that will keep all of your items in PowerPoint lined up. And believe me, things being lined up on a poster will make the difference between a tidy, neat, professional looking poster and one that looks like it hasn't had the appropriate care taken in preparing it. Other things that will help you keep your boxes lined up once you've lined them all up are to group sections of your poster to make sure that if you have to move them, they all move together and they move in a group and stay in alignment. So those are some really general observations about making posters. I'm going to try and distill that into what I think are 10 top tips for making a good poster. There's a bit of repetition here because it's really, some of the key factors are really important. So I've already mentioned this. Number one, follow the instructions from the organiser. If you're asked to make an A0 landscape poster, then make an A0 landscape poster. Do not decide to make an A0 portrait poster because it won't fit on the board. Similarly, with, with your electronic presentations, they will be fitting on a portrait size screen. So making a landscape poster will not work very well. Crucially, follow the instructions from the organiser, not your supervisor or your boss. They may think they know better, but they aren't defining the rules for the poster presentation. So really make sure that you get those instructions clear in your head and follow them crisp, crisply. Give yourself plenty of time to make your poster. Top tip number two, start now. Start almost as soon as this webinar's finished because making a bad poster is easy, but making a really effective poster is actually much trickier than you may think. Here's an example of what I think is a rushed poster. <clears throat> Lots of text running across the page, making it difficult to read, wacky font, which is quite distracting, figures lacking legends, results and conclusions merged together, and the data, very small. I have no idea what this is showing. More importantly, I don't actually want to read this poster. It does not call to me to say, actually, there's something important here. So think about how it's going to grab the reader. Top tip number three, keep in mind the structure of your poster. Think about the flow, the introduction, what you've done, why, you've, why, why the area that you've studied is important, how you've conducted your study, the key results and the conclusions. <clears throat> a poster is not a paper, it's not a scientific manuscript, so it should be accessible in a maximum of five minutes, aim for two, even less. It needs to be very quickly assimilated by people that are reading. What is this poster showing me? The numbers will help you navigate the poster, as I said, and really do not put the abstract on your poster unless you're requested to. I see many times posters where the abstract has been pasted into the top box. Your readers have the abstracts, they have the Estray app, they will be able to read the abstract. So don't put the abstract on the poster unless they ask. Here's an example of a poster that for me lacks that follow, lacks following that flow. Large introduction, big long slugs of text that make it difficult to read. I presume this is the method, but I don't know. And then moving through the data, I have no idea which order I should be looking at this data to follow the structure and story of the poster. More importantly, I have no idea what the conclusions of these data are. So whilst there's lots of impressive looking data on there, I have no idea what this means and neither will any other reader. So think about that flow, background, how you've done it, what you have shown, key message. An example of, for me, quite a, an uninteresting poster. It has a structure, an introduction, an objective, a very large materials and methods that describe essentially five figures. The conclusions are quite small, difficult to read, and the results are described, but there are no figure legends. What does figure A show? What does figure B show? What does figure C show? So think about making sure that you have legends for your figures, as well as a descriptive description in the results section. Top tip number four, colours. This is often an area that people think they can get a bit creative with. And you can, you can make your posters whatever colours you choose, whatever designs you choose. My strong advice is to keep it simple. 
I mentioned earlier on dark text and a white background always works better than light text and a dark background. Try to keep this, try to keep your poster looking smart and crisp and clean. Don't go for wild color combinations. Not all people will be able to read all color combinations. Particularly, I would avoid using red and green together because a surprising number of people suffer from red green color blindness and will not be able to distinguish key factors and key information in your poster. A general comment for making posters, not necessarily um, applicable to Esheray, is if you are having to get your print poster printed, get a proof from your printer before you get your big poster printed because the colours will always print differently than they look on your screen. Top tip number five, figures. As I said, keep them clear, keep them crisp. Don't have too many. Don't have large essays on the page, but do describe your figures. Here is an example of a page of graphs. Again, there is no legends. I don't know what these figures are showing. And the text is not mapped, is not lined to the figure. So figure one, I presume, is this one. Figure two is this one. But I'm having to look at the data, my eyes having to move up the page, down the page, up the page, down the page. Try and keep your figures the minimum that you need to present your to present your story and keep your legends next to your figures so that I can so that the reader can follow what the poster is showing. I've said this a few times, don't forget to put your name on it, don't forget to put your institution and put your contact details on, but make it readable. Be proud that you've done this work. Top tip number seven, a general tip, not necessary for Esheray, talk to your printers. I've already mentioned getting a proof to check your colours. But when you need to get a poster printed, find out how long your printers are going to need to print it. There's no point in going the day before you're due to fly to a conference in Tahiti if your printer is closed. Make sure you give yourself plenty of time when necessary to get a poster printed. Think about whether that poster needs to be printed on paper, whether you wish to encapsulate it to make it tougher, but that will increase the cost and the weight. And nowadays we're seeing a move towards fabric posters, which can be really easy for transport, but need to be ironed once you get to the place that you're presenting it. Top tip number eight. <clears throat> I always think it's worth printing off a few A4 copies of your poster for people to take away with them. If people, people are particularly interested in your study, they will have the abstract, but where you're able to, if you can let them take a copy of the data, it's a nice thing to take away. It means that people remember your work. They'll put that poster into that A4 copy of your poster into their conference bag. They'll go back to their office the week later, clear their emails, go through their conference and go, oh, I remember that poster, it was excellent. And they will then follow your work, see what's happening. Top tip number nine, <clears throat> your poster will at some point be presented. You will talk about your work. Don't forget that you are presenting this work. So can you answer questions on your work? More importantly, can you explain the study in under five minutes? And I'll come back to that in closing slides of this presentation. And top tip number 10, another, a general, another general tip, not necessarily for Esheray because you'll be doing submitting electronic posters. But if you're taking a hard copy poster with you and it's an overseas conference, check with your airline that your poster does not count as your hand baggage. Because it'd be pretty embarrassing if you turned up to the Ryanair desk and had to pay 60 or 70 euros just to take your poster away with you. For the last couple of minutes, I just want to say a few words about presenting your poster. At some point you, during the conference, you will talk about your work and about what your poster shows. So be really clear in your mind how you will do that. Think of it as a mini talk, a mini plenary. And I would recommend having what I call an elevator pitch. Can you describe your work in one to two minutes? The length of time it would take for an elevator to go from the bottom of a building to the top floor. Have that pitch, have that description and practice it. Be really crisp really clear in how you are going to explain the work that you have done. And when you present it, present with pride because your research has been accepted at Esheray and that is an achievement in itself. So try and relax and be comfortable. If you're attending a poster session where you're presenting, make an effort, try and look like you mean business, dress smart, but wear comfy shoes. I've seen many people at long conference sessions 
in very high heels, looking very smart, but after an hour, their feet are killing them, and that's the only thing they can think about, becomes distracted from presenting their poster. If you are attending a poster session, try and stay for the entire session. When the conference book says that there is a two hour poster session, the attendees will expect to be able to go at any point in those two hours. So they may go and get their coffee first. Make sure you stay for the entire session because you may miss the opportunity to talk to a really important person who's fascinated with your work. Try not to leave early. So we're coming to the end. And if I'd summarize what, I'd, what I've said, I'd try and keep it very clear. Whenever making, you're making a poster, try and keep it simple. Simple is good. Crisp, clear, with the killer information, your data standing out front and center. Highlight the important parts, especially within your, the text section, text heavy sections. Don't write an essay on a page. Crisp, clear, short statements about the background and what you've done. Make sure that your poster has all of the boxes, all of the figures, all of the sections lined up to make it look tight, keep it looking tidy. Don't overcrowd your post with too much information because that's just distracting and the reader will lose interest. Start making your poster early to give your co-authors a chance to review. And with anything that you prepare, as I said at the abstracts, preparing your abstracts, check it, check it, and then check it again. And I look forward to seeing you in Vienna. Thank you very much for your attention. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to try and answer them as I can. Thank you very much, Dr. Surmi. Um, well, we didn't get any questions during the session, so if there's someone uh, who has a question now, you can still enter it in the box and we can go through it. Okay, nothing is coming in, so I, I assume no one has a question. That means that the presentation was very clear. Well, in most uh, I, I'm guessing it's lunchtime for most people, so I'm guessing people want to race off and grab a quick bite to eat before they head back into the working afternoon. Probably, but I, I did get two questions now. Um, oh. One question is, can we add more data? You, I, there's no reason why not. As long as you make sure that the poster, that the, the data that is in your abstract is accurately represented in your poster, that is important. Getting an abstract accepted, people will expect to see that data presented. So because you've had your abstract accepted, you can't then go and present a completely different poster. However, if you have supplementary findings, I think that is an acceptable thing to do as long as that data in the abstract is presented clearly and crisply. Um, some people are asking when they get uh, information about uh, um... How, well, about uh, the, the poster requirement, I think they should have been sent last week. Um, but I can always check this with our colleague Heidi, um, but she's receiving quite some emails. So if you have sent an email to her, I'm sure she will answer you in, in the next two weeks. <laughs> um, what else is there? Uh, if the references are long, how can we put it in our poster? Should we write all of them or just write the most relevant? I would recommend putting all of the references in, but you can put the references in using a very small font size because they, they just need to be there that they can be read if necessary so people can check them. So what I recommend to students, my own students, is to have a very small text box with a font size of maybe 10 and also use an abbreviated referencing format. So this isn't a full journal, so you don't need all of the authors and the title and the, the year of publication and the volume and the issue number. You can use the short format. So for instance, first author et al, title name, abbreviated journal, year and pages. So that will save space, but I would wherever possible recommend putting all of these um, citations on. However, this is a poster, so you shouldn't need all that many. I think if you're looking to, if you're needing more than maybe 10 or 12 citations, you're maybe having a few too many citations on your poster. You only need the crisp, clear, relevant ones to support the work that you're doing. Okay. Um, is there a particular referencing style required for in-text referencing? Generally not. I would say check with the organizers of the conference that you're presenting at. I don't think SRA do 
have a particular referencing style. You can use the number, number format or you can use the author date format. Often this can be dictated by space. Author date format is often easier than trying to use numbers, especially if you're going to be using small text to correspond in the text, within the text, a number to the reference list. So if you have very small font for your reference list and then you're using a number and people want to go and check the number to the reference list, that can be quite difficult. So I would recommend, if possible, my own, and this is a personal preference, using an author date. So first author et al date, because then most people will be familiar with what that study will be. Um, someone else asks if it is okay to use QR codes, if it would be a good way of presenting additional uh, images or information. Yeah, I think this is this is a, a new development and I think it's a good idea. I think it's it's really, really a, an ex excellent way to present ex additional data. However, remember that some of us older and grumpier people in the world don't have necessarily access to QR code readers. Some of us are a li little bit less technologically advanced than others. So whilst you, I would recommend it's absolutely fine to use them, make sure that your poster does not rely on them. Make sure that if people don't have a QR reader or don't know what a QR code is, they can still get that key information from your poster. So only for supplementary, nothing for key core data that needs to be on your poster. Okay. Um, someone else asks if the graphics can be colorful or only if you should only use one color. Personal preference. I think colors, graphics can be colorful. Um, but don't go over the top, in my view. I think colours can be useful, but they can also be very distracting when you have multiple colours. Okay. It really is a personal preference thing. I would tend to try and keep colours, my own personal preference is to keep them simple and try and have a theme or a format because, again, it looks like you've put design and design thought into your poster. So if you're going for a, a blue and white type poster, try and use phase, hey, um, shades of blue and white to keep it looking crisp and clean, rather than having a rainbow of colours, which can look quite distracting. Okay, um, that was actually the last question, so I think we more or less answered all of them. So uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Sturmey, for having this webinar, and thank you everyone for participating. Um, and then I wish all of you a very nice afternoon. Have a nice day.